in every case, when the Buddha explains the different sets of From the Wings to Awakening, he says that each set is developed by developing the Noble Eightfold Path. This means that the path is central. It's the most important of the sets. And you can see this in the Buddhist teaching career. It was the very first of its teachings. He started his first teaching with the Noble Eightfold Path as the middle way. And the very last person he taught, he said, it's only in a teaching where you have the Noble Eightfold Path that you're going to find anyone awakened. The eight folds of the path are actually eight factors. And they come in three sets. The first two, right view and right resolve, form a set under discernment. The next three, right speech, right action, right livelihood, come under virtue. And the last three, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, come under concentration. What's distinctive about the path is that of the various sets of the Wings to Awakening, it's the only one that starts with discernment, the discernment of right view. Now notice that's view, not knowledge. It's a view that you take on as a working hypothesis. And there are various ways in which the Buddha describes how the different factors interact, but he always says right view comes first. This may relate to the fact that in the second knowledge that he gained on the night of his awakening, he saw that people suffer, suffer pain, suffer miserable rebirths, or enjoy pleasant rebirths because of their actions, and they act the way they do because of their views. So you have to start with the right view if you want to have the right actions that get the right results. And particularly right view about what kinds of actions lead to suffering, what kind of actions lead away. Right view comes in two levels. There's mundane right view, which talks about the basic principle of karma and how it relates to rebirth. And there's transcendent right view, which is the Four Noble Truths. That too is an explanation of action, actions of craving lead to the result, which is suffering. The actions of the Noble Eightfold Path lead to the result, which is the end of suffering. You have to understand that. In the beginning, you don't really know it, and you haven't even had that view confirmed yet, which is why when the Buddha made a comparison between the path and a chariot, the two horses that lead the chariot our conviction and discernment. Conviction in these principles. Conviction strong enough so that you try them out and act on them. And the discernment is realizing that this is really a good set of views to take on as working hypothesis. As the Buddha said elsewhere, if you believe that your actions play no role in determining your happiness or your pain, then what motivation would you have to act in a skillful way, to put forth any effort at all, or even to think about the consequences of your actions? That kind of view is a dead-end view. As the Buddha said, even when you don't know for sure, you want to adopt a view that opens possibilities and not one that closes them. As you hear the Buddha saying, you can, through your own efforts, put an end to suffering. If you don't put an end to suffering, suffering can just keep going on. From that right view, the other factors of the path come. The Buddha compares it to a seed. If you have wrong view, he says it's like a seed for a bitter melon. You're going to get a bitter fruit. If you have a right view, it's like a, a grape seed. You've got a sweet fruit. As you think about the power of your actions, you realize that you have to make up your mind that you're going to follow a course of action that leads to happiness. 
you're going to have to go against a lot of your old ingrained habits. This is what right resolve is for. It's not merely an intention, it's a resolve. It's stronger than just everyday intentions, because intentions can come and go. They go one direction, they go another direction. But with right resolve, you need to make up your mind. You want to go in a particular direction. You resolve on renunciation, in other words, putting an end to your desire for sensuality, seeing that renunciation would be a good thing, and then try to act on that. Non-ill will, in other words, goodwill or equanimity, whenever it's appropriate. And then harmlessness, which would be compassion. You try to make these the motives of your actions consistently. And then from these resolves come your actions. First your speech. You realize the harm that's done by lying, by divisive speech, by harsh speech and idle chatter. And you try to abandon them, abstain from them. You see the harm that comes from killing, stealing, having illicit sex. So you try to abandon those things as well. You see the harm that comes from wrong livelihood. When you engage in a livelihood that either breaks the precepts or gives rise to passion, aversion, or delusion in your own mind or in the minds of other people. This is where you actually carry through on your resolves. And as you're carrying through, you begin to realize more and more that the important element is the mind. The mind's got to be trained beyond just simply having a right view. You have to work on developing skillful qualities in the mind, abandoning unskillful ones. That's right effort. And you have to develop powers of concentration. That starts with right mindfulness and goes into the levels of jhana and right concentration. Now when you get at right concentration, it's not like you're arriving at the end of the path. The path spirals around. Concentration then becomes a basis for more discernment. When the mind is still, it can see itself a lot more clearly. And you begin to see the, the suffering that the Buddha identified with the clinging aggregates is there even in the concentration. Remember the other image that the Buddha has of the path, which is that it's a raft. It's a raft made out of twigs, branches. In other words, you have some clinging in your suffering, but there's a skillful kind of clinging that applies to the path. You put aside clinging to sensuality, or try your best to do that, but then you develop clinging to views, i.e. right view, clinging to habits and practices, the habits of the, the precepts, right speech, right action, and the practice of concentration. And even a clinging of a doctrine of self, that you are able to do this. So as you're assembling the path, you need those forms of clinging. But there comes a point where the path has been developed and you don't need the clinging anymore. And that's when you start to turn on the path itself, analyzing your concentration in terms of those five clinging aggregates, seeing that this is fabricated. No matter how good the bliss and rapture, equanimity that come from concentration, they still have to be maintained. There's still an effort involved there. And they can fall away. You want something more secure. Now, right view is what confirms that there is something more secure. That's in the Third Noble Truth, the end of suffering. Which is what encourages you to analyze the concentration and start taking it apart. You think of the Buddha's teachers. The two people from whom he learned the formless attainments. They were afraid that if they took apart their attainments, they'd have nothing. And it's amazing that the Buddha was able to take his own concentration apart. 
But we have the example of the Buddha himself and of his noble disciples saying that you have to keep aiming for the unfabricated, and you will not be disappointed. And so when your attachment to the concentration and all the other factors of the path falls away, that's when you have your first taste of the deathless. It's at that point that the Noble Eightfold Path has become complete. In fact, that's what the definition of stream entry is, is the Eightfold Path coming together, yielding the deathless. And that's what confirms your views. This is why someone who's attained the stream is said to be consummate in view and also consummate in virtue. The first five factors of the path have been mastered. The last three have not yet been mastered. There's still more work to be done in concentration. And you have to move from view to knowledge for awakening to be complete. But for those first five factors, the stream enter is safe. As a passage where the Buddha talks about different kinds of loss. There's loss of wealth, loss of relatives, loss of health. Those, he says, are minor. Loss of right view, loss of virtue, those are major. And that's an area where the stream enter is secure. He or she will never lose right view, will never lose virtue. Which is why the stream enters rebirths from that point on, never fall below the human. But for those of us who haven't fully reached the stream, for whom the Eightfold Path hasn't been com become complete, we're still in a position of danger. Our views could change. And once the views change, then virtue changes as well. As the Buddha said, the untrained mind can change directions so fast that there's no adequate analogy for how quick it is. Which means that we have to be heedful, try to put the path together and maintain it as best we can, and keep at it, at it, at it. Because that's the only place where safety can be found. And once the path is complete like this, then all the other fact, <coughs> all the other, excuse me, all the other wings to awaken are completed as well. You got the basis for success in the concentration. You got the four establishings of mindfulness and right mindfulness. You got the four right exertions and right effort. All five of the faculties are there, all seven of the factors for awakening are there. So the lesson here is work on your right view. Make sure you understand that wherever they're suffering, that's a big issue. but particularly the suffering that comes from clinging. And the clinging is not caused by things outside. It's caused by your own craving. So when you're looking for the causes of suffering, you can look inside, find them. They're right here to be seen. They're nothing mysterious or nothing hidden. Simply that we don't pay appropriate attention to them. They're in big, blank areas of the mind. The craving comes from what? It comes from ignorance. And ignorance is not just not knowing. It's looking at things in the wrong terms, focusing your attention in the wrong places. There's a passage where the Buddha compares consciousness to a magic trick. And the nature of a magic trick is 
the magician tries to divert your attention from what he's actually doing. You focus on something far away, or you think you're paying careful attention to where he's paying careful attention. Actually, he's doing something else. Okay, that's the nature of consciousness which is overcome by ignorance. So we want to look into these areas where we think we know and ask yourself, okay, does this knowledge really put it into suffering? If not, it's not right view, it's ignorance. Try to locate the suffering in your clinging, locate the cause of the suffering in your craving. That's when you're on the right path. We put together all the other factors of the past so you can see these things clearly. Abandon the craving. That'll put it into suffering. Because those clinging aggregates, not the case that they're clinging to you, you're clinging to them. When you let go, they have no hold on the mind. This is why the Buddha's image for awakening is of fire going out. In those days they saw fire as clinging to its fuel. And when the fire went out, it let go. It's not the case that the fuel clung to the fire. The fire was doing the clinging, and then it was trapped. When it was not trapped by the fuel, it was trapped by its own clinging. So when you're really <coughs> willing to adopt that view, that you're trapped by your own clinging, that's when you're beginning to plant the, the grape seeds in your mind, the seeds that lead to a sweet fruit. And then you nurture those seeds and all the other factors of the path will grow as well. And they would stop there. They'll yield the deathless. Let's say at stream entry here, you gain the Dharma eye in which you see that all things that are subject to origination are also subject to passing away. Now that insight is going to occur to the mind naturally only when you see something that is not originated and doesn't pass away. After Sarabhuta had gained the Dharma eye, he went back to tell Moggallana, his friend. At this point, neither of them had ordained. Moggallana saw him coming from afar, and he noticed that Sariputta looked like a different person from what he had known. His first question was, have you seen the deathless? And Sariputta said, yes. So we practice this path so we can see the deathless too, something that, allows, <coughs> something that lies outside of space, outside of time. And we have our first glimpse of that. That's when our right view becomes confirmed. The fact that it, that view was obscured by our unskillful actions. That's why we would never intentionally break the precepts ever again. And you realize that when the aggregates fall away, as you see the deathless, Your awareness there of the deathless is not annihilated, so there's no reason why you would ever want to identify yourself with the aggregates ever again. The mind has been unfettered from three fetters. It still has some more to work, to work on. But the really heavy ones have been put down for good.